warm welcome to everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Sophie Lambin, and I'm the editor partner for the Women's Forum for the Economy and Society. At the Women's Forum, we believe that women's voices and vision are crucial to building a more inclusive economy and society. In collaboration with the New York Times, we are delighted to be hosting a series of live and recorded conversations with women leaders. These conversations also reflect our desire to take aim at injustice and inequality, something that is critically needed, as events in the US and worldwide clearly demonstrate. Our speakers today are women from around the world, women on the front lines, women leading us through the crisis and through the recovery. Today, we'll have a dynamic conversation with two speakers who will talk about a governing global health in, pandemic, in a pandemic and about addressing structural inequalities that affect people's access to health. You can also follow the conversation on social media with the hashtag Women for Inclusion and in her words. And now, I am pleased to welcome Jessica Bennett, Gender Editor at Large for the New York Times, who will lead today's conversation. Jessica, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sophie. Chelsea and Debbie, welcome. I'll give a brief introduction about each of you. Chelsea Clinton is the Vice Chair of the Clinton Foundation and teaches at the Mailman School of Public Health at Columbia University. She's the author of several children's books, which many of which I have on my bookshelf behind me, including the number one New York Times bestseller, She Persisted, 13 American Women Who Changed the World, the book of Gutsy Women, co-authored with her mother, Hillary Clinton, and with Debbie, Governing Global Health, Who Runs the World and Why. Debbie Shridhar is Professor and Chair of Global Public Health at the University of Edinburgh Medical School and Founding Director of the Global Health Governance Program. Her books include with Chelsea, Governing Global Health, and the battle against hunger, choice, circumstance, and the World Bank. Thank you both for being here. Thank you, Jessica, for having us. Thank you. So just to break the ice for a moment, can you tell us each where you are calling in from? What is life like for you right now? Debbie? Uh, so I am calling in from Edinburgh in Scotland. Um, life has been absolutely insane since the start of 2020 as um, the COVID outbreak took off. Scotland is still in lockdown and hoping to emerge from this in the next couple of weeks as the number of cases drops. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I am uh, calling in from New York and you know, Jessica, I think this conversation is going to run in a couple of days, but here kind of on this Tuesday, you know, New York City is entering phase one. Uh, Westchester and other parts of the state are entering phase two, uh, trying to hopefully safely um, open up uh, kind of in this still uh, COVID-19 moment uh, that we all continue to uh, live in. Um, and I think that is kind of the dominant uh, narrative, you know, in some ways for, for Debbie and me with kind of what we're dealing with in our own lives, as well as here in the United States, um, grappling with hopefully um, kind of the reckoning of white supremacy uh, the original stain on the United States of America. So, you know, there's a lot, I think, happening in both our lives um, as kind of two Americans, whether kind of we're still in the United States or in Scotland, who care deeply about um, about public health. And clearly, uh, infectious diseases and racism are two things that deeply affect public health, and especially for women. Right. And you're touching on the ways that these things are so interlinked in this moment. You know, we are seeing structural inequalities brought to the surface and exposed in ways that feel different, but actually are really connected. You know, we have a health crisis that is disproportionately affecting African Americans. We're having massive global protests against police violence that kills African Americans. Some have called this a pandemic within a pandemic. Could you talk a bit about how these things are interlinked? Debbie, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess you can see this manifesting and actually even who this virus is affecting. I mean, the way it was described to me is it's like the tide being pulled back and revealing all these inequalities and 
and problems that have been around for many years, um, but are now just kind of becoming more acute. So at least in, in, in Britain, for example, why is it that you know 70% of kids who are presenting with an inflammatory disorder linked to COVID are from um, black or ethnic minority backgrounds? Why is it half of pregnant women presenting in hospital are from these same backgrounds? And same with um, health workers who are dying, doctors and midwives and nurses, there's something going on and simple explanations aren't cutting it. It's actually getting into much deeper issues and structural issues. You know, and, and everything that kind of Debbie is talking about that she's observing, you know, in the UK is certainly what we're seeing here um, in the United States. I mean, you know, if you are black and uh, acquire COVID, you are more than three and a half times more likely to die of COVID than if you are white with a very similar kind of pre-existing conditions um, kind of uh, history. So we know that kind of this disease is not only exposing, but uh, preying on kind of structural inequalities and inequities and kind of you know, generations of a failure to do anything about those. I'm curious, so as we've seen protests spread for George Floyd's death, not just here in the United States, but really globally, there have been several doctors groups, including the American Medical Association, that have been emphasizing just this, that racism is a public health issue. And I was reading yesterday about how at Brown University, at the public, the School of Public Health there, students are in fact demanding that professors take a strong stand against police violence and direct research dollars to study it. So I'd be curious to hear from you, how should we think about racism and systemic inequity as public health issues? Yeah, I think my answer would be definitely. I mean, I think if you look even in the past, you know, at maternal mortality areas or infant mortality, it's so clear that there are differences along um, racial or ethnic lines. I mean, it's a really weird moment because people try to look at health and say it's technical and they say it shouldn't be political. But actually, public health is so intrinsically political. It's the decisions you make over the allocation of resources. It's how you actually unpick what is happening and what you're gonna do about it. And so it's a strange moment watching the protests because a part of my brain is thinking, this is gonna be really bad in terms of transmission. And this is the opposite of what you want. On the other hand, a part of my brain is saying, this is exactly what's needed at this moment in time. And the people who are going out to protest are not doing it even for themselves. They're doing it for their kids and their grandkids. They're seeing it's a larger trajectory of change. Um, and so it's it's a it's an important time, and I think especially to the younger generation who are watching to take a strong stand. And my stand has always been that it's in your actions, not only your words, and it's in your daily practice of what you change. And you should be as ready to um, protest on the streets as you are to protest inside your workplace or you know in your daily life. You know, and I think too, Jessica. Um, you know, just. Like from my perspective, teaching at at Mailman, um, you know, the uh, Black and Latinx uh, kind of student leadership council reached out to me, and I know to lots of faculty, and I certainly um, responded immediately and have kind of talked to them and engaged with them, and are supporting kind of their efforts to also drive more research dollars um, for faculty and students uh, to racial disparities widely. I mean, not only around kind of um, policing period and policing tactics and kind of the application of force by police. Um, but as Debbie was mentioning, kind of, you know, maternal mortality, we know in the United States that um, black women are three to four times more likely to die um, in childbirth or uh, because of childbirth related complications than non-Hispanic white women. We know that black infants are twice as likely to die, you know, in their first 30 days of life in the United States than kind of non-Hispanic white infants. So. Um, we have so much work to do and we have so much more data that we need to be able to kind of, as Debbie was saying, like understand where best we urgently need to be allocating um, resources. And so I really appreciate the students at Mailman who are putting pressure on um, faculty and, and leadership um, to be responsive, not only rhetorically, um, but substantively and meaningfully to this moment. What do you tell them about where to begin? It seems like 
what you know another thing that this pandemic has done has really eroded trust of institutions and you know we've seen doctors talk about how black patients either don't want to get tested out of reluctance to see a doctor or fear that their symptoms won't be taken seriously or just a lack of available testing in their communities these gaps can feel so big what do you say to your students about where to begin Debbie. Yeah, so I think, um, you know, the two things I mean, I have been saying to them is first to use your voice, that they do have a voice and they should use it. Um, I think students are sometimes timid to bring up issues or to rock the boat. And a part of me just says, like, use your voice and, you know, try to find senior members who will support you. I'll always support you if you if you want to take these agendas forward. I think the second one is a little bit out of their control and it's about leadership. And the countries that you've seen that have done better, and this is generally true in public health, and this is what was clear in the Ebola crisis in 2014, is it's about trust. And to trust requires clear communication and honesty and integrity by leadership. And I think if you look at the leaders in various countries who have done well, they carry their people because the people think the government is acting in their best interest, um, which is what a government should do. I think what has become quite dangerous in certain settings, especially with populist governments, is that people don't think the government is acting in their best interest. So every individual tries to make decisions that they think are best for themselves or their families or their communities or their business. And that's the opposite of what you want because you basically get rampant um, individualism, um, even if it's beyond that like, communism, tribalism, all the things that go against what you need in a crisis, which is actually pulling together. So it's also about voting and electing leaders that you think are actually going to represent you know your best interest and your community's best interest yeah, i mean i'll just say like a massive amen to that um you know i i certainly think uh part of what we've seen too in the last few months um are kind of leaders who not only have earned and been able to kind of continually earn the trust of um, their populations have done so by um, kind of being in partnership with public health experts and uh, not only kind of um, listening to, but really kind of amplifying and sometimes, you know, handing the mic to those public health um, experts so that there is kind of clear, consistent communication that isn't um, kind of infantilizing people and isn't talking over people, but is giving people kind of tangible information that they can act on in their own lives for themselves and their families to try to keep themselves safe today and kind of you know, going forward. And so I would just say too, I think um, voting is also hopefully, um, and I hope that we will see more of this, you know, Jessica in the United States, you know, hopefully also voting for people who believe in science and who believe kind of in kind of the process of science and kind of the importance of science, kind of whether we're talking about kind of climate change or health disparities, kind of whether kind of we're talking about kind of what really makes a difference for students in a classroom and also kind of how to help uh, protect ourselves kind of and, you know, our communities kind of as as we navigate forward in this COVID moment until we have a vaccine. So, you know, I hope that we just continue to kind of push for pro science and kind of pro evidence and, and data uh, leadership at, at every level of government. Are there leaders who have done this successfully? I mean, of course, there's been a lot of talk about nations run by women and a line made between responses and the gender of who's leading that country. Who has done it well? Who has communicated effectively? What what should leadership look like in this moment? Well, I mean, I would point to um, Angela Merkel in Germany, in Europe, and how clearly she communicates science, how much she's been able to carry um, you know, the, Germ the German people to do things that perhaps were uncomfortable at the start in terms of distancing or masks or other measures. And then clearly Jacinda Ardern in New Zealand in terms of her humanity and saying very clearly at the start that her, it is unacceptable to her that people will die of this, there must be a better way. And she will do everything to have this be a better way. And they did implement a very hard lockdown, but I think the people understood that actually she's doing this in their interest. I thought a lot about why is it about female leadership? Because it is something that's come out through this, that you keep seeing female leaders doing better. And it's, I wonder if it has to do with gambling and that this virus was a gamble when it arrived in countries. Like you didn't really know what it, what it could do. We don't really know 
the exact fatality rate. We don't know the long-term health complications. Um, so it's about how much risk you want to take and how risk averse are you and, and the weighing of that. And it just seemed to me that female, you know, women leaders didn't want to take many risks. They go cautiously. They think very carefully about the impact on people and on lot like human, like human lives, not just numbers. And, um, and just thought about this in a, in a more risk averse way. Um, I think that's what it, that's that's the pattern that comes out because I think back at the countries that tried herd immunity or just you know letting it go and there was a sense of just like a gamble like the roll of the dice we'll see what happens and I just my sense is that the female leaders that I saw maybe it's a generalization they just were more cautious. You know, and I would say too, um, I think, and again, I, I recognize as well this is a generalization, but I do think um, listening to um, you know Chancellor Merkel or to um, Jacinda Ardern and other um, women kind of you know, from Finland and elsewhere, um, there just was this refusal to think that somehow the economy and public health think that were like on opposite ends of a scale, because of course they aren't. And we don't tend to think of them as being on opposite ends of the scale, you know, on any given day, like why on earth would we accept that framing kind of in the midst of a, of a crisis? And I think that um, refusal to kind of succumb to that kind of gross oversimplification um, also um, is something that has been pretty consistently true across the leaders that have responded well kind of you know over the over the last few months um, and I think the absence of that has also sadly been consistently true for those who have continually failed you know including including our president in this moment yeah I think it's been hard not to think about uh, what might have <laughs> played out had your mother been president in this moment. I, th I think about it every day, Jessica, <laughs> in this crisis, in a way that I did not before the crisis. I've been consumed with kind of just anger and um, sadness since late January. I mean, since like Debbie and I first really started talking about this in late January. Um, and we, uh, we co-wrote an op-ed that CNN ran you know, in late February, but we for, we wrote the first draft. I went back and looked like on February 4th about the ways in which we thought Donald Trump was uniquely unqualified to lead in this moment um, and kind of all the evidence kind of that we could marshal sadly to kind of support that um, thesis. And yes, I've thought more about the election in this kind of uh, COVID-19 era than probably any time since um, late 2016, because it just, uh, has been such a, a, a sad, tragic failure of leadership um, out of the White House because of the president's allergy to science and narcissism and arrogance and kind of you know many other other reasons as well. And I, and I could just add to that. I mean, what this reveals to me is that we want to elect leaders that we think are smarter than us. Like I want someone in charge who can figure out the logistics for a very complex operational um, program to do testing and tracing across millions of people. You know, I want someone who's who's attend to who understands the intricacies of you know why different tests matter and when you would use them. We tend to you know the, at least in this is you know also in Britain you know people come to power based on spin based on, based on messaging based on what they say. And this is just revealed that actually what you really need is people who just behind the scenes will get things done. And it's about boring stuff that doesn't capture headlines, systems, logistics, governance, you know, how do you get that over there, that over there? I mean, this is what it comes down to. And the countries that have done well, just get on and do it. Um, don't talk about it so much. Um, so that's quite revealing. I think the moment when you realize that the people in charge um, maybe are not as qualified as you hope they'd be at this moment in time. Well, and I think one of the biggest shocks was when President Trump announced that he would cut ties with the World Health Organization. Um, he said the health body had failed to make great, we needed reforms. I know that both of you have written a bit about this, but how has the WHO fared historically and does Trump misunderstand the role that it could play? Yeah, so for me, it's quite, you know, it's a simple explanation, which is, Obviously, things have gone bad in the states, badly in the states, and then you need to blame someone. And the easiest person to blame was China, 
Then it became hard with China, so they're blaming the WHO. And and and, and the agency, it feels to me, it's like a, a child whose parents are battling it out and doesn't want to be in the fight and kind of tries to stay quiet and get along with everyone. And he completely misunderstands the role. It's not an enforcer. It's not an investigator. It is a health technical agency which convenes countries together. Did WHO praise China heavily in January? Yes. Why did they do that? Because they wanted to have the um, the data and the information and cooperation of the Chinese government. And they did not want to have a repeat of SARS where you had the hiding of information and that meant the rest of the world suffered. They needed to get out the sequencing so you could create test kits. So these could be mailed to other countries. So when actually people started arriving, you could actually test them. And in terms of that metric, I think it was quite successful. They did get that out. They got a mission in. And so I think it's it's a complete diversion from the real core issue, which is that the WHO declared a public health emergency of international concern, which is the highest level of alarm on January 30th. Other countries could prepare or not prepare. Some were preparing before that. If you look at South Korea and Taiwan and Hong Kong, they didn't need the WHO ringing the alarm bell. And at that point, what happened like in February and March? Like, I don't understand how we're in June. And this is, I was counting the months. And I was like, why am I so tired? It was six months out. What was happening for those five months? And I think that's really what we should have been asking instead of pointing at the WHO, because they did their job. They rang the alarm bell. That's what their job is to do. Well, and I think also what Debbie, you know, is saying, Jessica, is that as much as WHO is a technical organization, it is also a political and diplomatic organization. I mean, it has 194 member states, you know, kind of with her analogy of kind of the warring parents, WHO is trying to kind of steward and shepherd um, kind of global public health as best it can, recognizing that different member states, you know, at this moment, kind of especially, you know, the United States and China have different um, agenda. And yet its core agenda is trying to help uh, support, uh, kind of protect, promote global public health as best as possible. And I think, you know, there is something you know, important in what Debbie said as well, kind of with getting the viral samples, developing then kind of the, the testing protocols, developing actually the tests, you know, it wasn't WHO that kind of you know, rejected the test for the United States of America. Like that was the American CDC um, that said effectively, like, no, thank you. Like we will develop our own tests. Um, that was a really unfortunate decision that the CDC made. And I say that as someone with tremendous respect for, you know, kind of the history of, of the CDC um, kind of over many decades. But that decision, you know, really helped set back kind of the American um, response and the fact that kind of this wasn't a priority for for the White House, I think only then kind of further um, kind of, you know, underscored the harm candidly that that decision kind of held um, and affected. So, you know, I, I think Debbie's completely right that kind of, you know, it is a convenient scapegoat um, for kind of this administration's failures. Uh, and I do think is kind of you know, Debbie and I have talked about now for many years, one of the greatest challenges for WHO kind of is its name, like the World Health Organization kind of implies that it does all things related to health for the world. And yet that has never been kind of its its purpose or its mandate. And yet I think, um, you know, President Trump, unfortunately, in many ways is a master marketer. And so he's able to exploit kind of the vulnerabilities in some ways kind of embedded in WHO's name itself to kind of point out its failure, even though he's holding it to a standard that it itself, um, its founders and historically its members have never held it to. Chelsea, I've heard you say before that there's a, a sort of an adage in public health, which is that outbreaks are inevitable, but epidemics are not. Has that shift held for, for us? What does that mean? Well, I yeah, no, I borrowed that from Larry Brilliant and other epidemiologists and kind of public health doctors who have, you know, kind of cautioned, you know, for, for many years, kind of through many public health crises that, yes, like outbreaks happen, right? You know, I mean, WHO a few years ago started preparing for something it was calling disease X, which probably would be a zoonotic virus, so a virus that would start in animals, kind of jump to humans, you know, especially dangerous if it were a respiratory virus. Like this is something that WHO and many others have been cautioning, you know, for for years. And so, Kind of yes, like outbreaks um, are inevitable, um, especially as kind of you know climate change and kind of the patterns of 
kind of how we are continuing to kind of develop our, our cities and our agriculture kind of encroach further and further kind of into into nature and kind of that we are in closer and closer proximity um, with animals. But epidemics are not. And I think, Jessica, we see that, you know, so clearly around the world. I mean, you know, look at look at not only New Zealand, but now Australia just declared that it had new COVID, no new COVID cases yesterday. I mean, look at kind of what has happened in, in South Korea, like where, you know, yes, there have been kind of waves, but the waves are measured like in the in the dozens and not the many thousands as we're kind of seeing here in the United States with, with new cases kind of as the locus of the um, kind of pandemic in the United States kind of shifts kind of to different cities and, and states. So I think uh, very tragically, Jessica, we are living in kind of the evidence of, of what Larry Brilliant and others have said um, and that we see kind of some countries that have you not only flatten the curve, but crush the curve, um, like New Zealand. And then in other places that are, you know, flattening the curve and then other places still that just somehow think like the curve is like a, a wave meant to be ridden, you know, irrespective of the harm and, and mortality, you know, that may result from that leadership choice. I'm really interested in the idea of healing in all of this because we've seen so much death and we've seen so much pain and now we're seeing protests and trauma, leftover trauma from years and years and years of systemic racism. And yet we don't really have these mechanisms in place to grieve or heal as a culture or as a group. You know, we haven't seen major acknowledgement by our president, funerals are being canceled. Um, we're still so much in the in the middle of this. Where do we begin? Have you thought about this? Yeah, it's a really difficult, difficult question. And I think there are major repercussions to the people who are not able to grieve their loved ones with funerals or even to be at their bedside. And um, you know, children who 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 have died of of COVID and not had any family members and their family members haven't been able to to be at their funeral. So it is, it is a major, major issue. I think it starts, and Chelsea mentioned this earlier with listening. I think, you know, and, and observing, um, you know, the, the protests and, and the police brutality from abroad as an American, and it's painful to watch. And I just think, you know, at this point in time, you need leadership that is willing to listen, that is willing to try to understand, or if you can't understand, at least again, let people express the anger they feel, the hurt and the pain and acknowledge it and try to find a way a way forward that brings people together. I think what's been hard to find is that actually instead of acknowledging the pain and the injustice um, has been the inflaming of it, making it worse. And so again, it comes back to, I guess, listening and, and leadership and empathy and realizing that actually it's what you're going through is maybe different to what someone else is going through. And so I think right now in the case of, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement, I just wish a lot of people would just be quiet and let, you know, the people who are protesting speak and listen to them because that's what they want, you know, take a knee and listen. I mean, I, yes, I mean, I just, I, I agree so fundamentally with everything Debbie said. And I think too, um, you know, Jessica, I think it's it's hard in some ways kind of, you know, thinking about, about COVID and then the kind of horrifying ways in which kind of COVID and, and white supremacy and systemic racism have um, kind of clashed into each other with real kind of painful consequence and death for so many people's lives. I think it's, it's also hard for um, even within the United States, people who don't maybe live in places that have been really affected to understand what that feels like. So, you know, more than one in 400 New Yorkers have died of COVID. You know, I, I know people who've died of COVID. I know people who are still in the hospital with COVID. And so I think too, um, trying to help, you know, all of us listen to one another, um, but especially listen kind of to Debbie's point to the Black Lives Matter protests to you know, are not only saying Black Lives Matter, but Black Voices Matter, um, especially listening to um, Black Americans who 
have lost loved ones to COVID, who may have loved ones still in the hospital, who have not been able to grieve um, kind of in kind of the traditional and expected ways, or at least not yet, who are now fighting for their lives and fighting for kind of the lives of, of their children and their kind of future. Um, I think kind of those of us who are not kind of at the epicenter of any of this, especially those of us who kind of are white, really have to um, listen and, and be silent and give platforms um, kind of wherever we can kind of to, um, to not only kind of people who are talking about kind of the police brutality, but who are also talking about the disproportionate effects of COVID and also talking about kind of other um, ways in which kind of systemic racism have uh, affected, shaped, scarred uh, their lives. Are you able to stay hopeful? Like, how do you keep optimism? And and I guess my second question to that is, are you talking to your kids about this? Like, how do we talk to our children about this as well? In a way that just isn't terrifying, which, which it is. Yeah, I think we have to keep hope and we have to stay positive and we have to keep looking forward and keep looking for solutions and keep thinking that things are gonna get better. Um, it's the only way. And I think the thing that I keep coming back to is, you know, there there is progress. I mean, we did have, um, you know, a, an amazing first lady who was, who, who was black. And um, we did have, you know, a, a, a trajectory of history has been, I forget the quote exactly, but, you know, has been positive. And I think it's about recognizing the history and talking to, to talking to kids about that, about this is what it was like 50 years ago. I mean, Chelsea's book, um, all her books actually um, for kids are all about that, telling those stories in a very positive way, in a hopeful way and saying you can make a difference. And I think the thing also is just realizing that, you know, people, kids aren't, I mean, it's obvious, but kids aren't born racist, it, they learn it. And so I always get hopeful when I see children because I see, and younger generations, because I see what the world can be. This is why I like working at the university as well, because I get to be around young people all the time um, for my job. And so we just have to be hopeful. It's hard to be, and I know there's gonna be a lot of mental health issues coming out of this, um, and, and it is easy to feel despair, but I think we have to remember, it's just six months into 2020, so. We have to keep looking forward. Yeah, and I think Jessica, you know, as Jim Kim, who I, I quote often and truly think about this every day, you know, who's one of the founders of Partners in Health and then um, president of the World Bank um, said, you know, optimism is a moral choice. And I believe that, you know, I, I believe it is a moral choice to think, uh, to believe and then to act as if like our energies and our efforts can make a difference. I mean, I think, you know, cynicism and, and pessimism are kind of the 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 kind of preserve and the territory of people who don't want anything to change, um, who who are you know at least comfortable with kind of how things things are. I think they are extraordinary tools of kind of the the powerful and you know in this country of kind of the the people who either consciously or not consciously kind of have have profited from kind of a, a system of white supremacy you know since kind of the the founding of our country, before the founding of our country. So I think we have to be optimistic because that is how things change. And I think, you know, the, the protesters are, are fundamentally optimistic, right? The Black Lives Matter movement is fundamentally an optimistic movement. Like, yes, like out of rage and anger um, at gross injustice, but also like the optimism and the expectation, um, kind of in the fierce expectation that things can change and, and the urgency kind of embedded in and thinking they they have to change and they have to change quickly, and I think we we see that you know so evidently um, kind of even in the last few weeks with how public opinion has shifted on everything from kind of you know po police brutality to kind of the institution of of police itself. So I think um, we have to be optimistic, and I think thankfully there are lots of reasons to be optimistic, and I think uh, we owe it to the protesters to be optimistic, and we owe it to you know, for Debbie and me, we owe it to our students to be optimistic. And I also think I owe it to my children uh, to be optimistic. I think that's a really nice place to end. And I guess if there's one call to action 
to wrap this up? Is it to go out and vote? Is it to go out and protest, write to our Congress people? That's a hard one. I mean, in, in the States, you have a vote coming up. We don't have one in Britain for a while. So please, please use your opportunity to vote because you'll realize once you vote, if you won't get another chance for, for that. But I think tied to that is I think it's about changing daily practice and what you do in your daily life and in your interactions. And so in a way, sometimes the more subtle things, the more nuanced things, the things that nobody sees that are on Instagramable or TikTokable or whatever are the most profound. Um, and so trying to think about how you live your daily life and those interactions. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And and also, Jessica, yes, like we, we have to vote. I mean, you know, we're talking today on a, on a Tuesday. I know um, this will go live you know, a little bit later this week, but we have elections in, in five states today. And um, yet we know people are being actively disenfranchised um, in some of those states, uh, because if you have to wait many hours, especially kind of many hours in the heat and many hours in the middle of the heat in the midst of a pandemic, like that is not exactly you know, what I would call a free and fair election because it has an almost uh, impossible and certainly kind of preposterous kind of uh, standard to meet to be able to participate. So yes, we have to vote, but we also have to continue to make it easier um, for people uh, to vote uh, in this country um, and really, really everywhere. And again, to vote for leaders who believe in science. And sorry to come in on that, but also, you know, to realize that there's like, if there's that, I think of the story, the emperor's new clothes, like if leaders are saying things that don't make any sense and you don't think they make any sense, like say it. Cause I feel like there's this weird thing that really bad things happen or bad decisions get made because everyone stays quiet because they don't really fully what's ha understand what's happening. But what is happening in the States is someone abroad is not normal. It is very bad. <laughs> I can just say, um, and incredibly tragic. And so I think also that just like constantly reminding yourself and doing a reality check, whether it's with friends or colleagues, that it's not just you. Because sometimes, you know, you listen to a press conference or you listen to a policy thing and you think, am I the only one? And um, yeah, so just like checking in with others so you make sure, you know, it's not you possibly, that there's actually something fundamentally different going on that's, um, yeah. Also. Yeah, like don't drink bleach and get your vaccines. <laughs> Right. I mean, kind of like basic things like don't drink like toxic chemicals and make sure that you get vaccinated, including against COVID when the science has sorted itself out. Science is good. Thank you. Chelsea, Abby, thank you both so much. It's a pleasure. <laughs> You're a wealth of knowledge. Um, I'm so glad to be able to speak with you. Thank you, Jessica. No, thanks so much. Thank you. A huge thank you to uh, Chelsea, Debbie, and, and Jessica for, for such a candid and, and rich exchange. You have highlighted that it takes pro-science, pro-evidence, and humble leadership that has people trust to guide us through the recovery. I've also heard you offering a real invitation to youth, maybe especially young women, to get their voice heard and to take on those leadership roles. So let me conclude by thanking you for your, for your own leadership and for your optimism and, and message of hope. Thank you, Jessica, for uh, a masterful and heartfelt moderation. So let me also remind everyone that, um, for those of you who are listening, that our next conversation on the 25th of June will be with Madeleine Albright, former US Secretary of State. So please save um, that date in your calendar. Thank you again very much for our listener for being with us today. Bye.